Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Welcome to my Christmas special for 2021. Have you been enjoying my reviews and Freestyle Friday videos of late? If you haven't been watching those farming practices videos, please be sure to check them out. So today's wines are a combination of wines I purchased and freebies, a kind of hodgepodge of sorts, wines that might be traditional and also some that may not be traditional for the average American. Things that if you were to come over, I would very likely pull. Considering that we always have some kind of Italian-themed food for our Christmas meal, you'll see I have an Italian red wine. I didn't go full Italian, however. Let's talk about each wine for a minute and then get to tasting them. I like to start with bubbly. It's just a great way to start a meal, really gets the juices flowing. I just got this one in for my good friends at Creative Palette. More Domaine Bousquet. If you're watching my other main Monday videos, then you're already familiar with the winery at this point, I, since I've been reviewing their wines for the past several weeks. And I have a few more after Christmas and New Year's. If you're new to my stuff, here's a brief overview of them. Founded by Jean Bousquet in 1997, he came from the Carcassonne area of Southwest France, where he had a winery. In 1990, he took a vacation to Argentina and visited the Watiati Valley. This is in the Tupangato region of the larger Uco Valley in the western central part of Argentina. The city of Mendoza is a little more than an hour's drive to the north. Jean was so enamored with the area, he decided to sell everything in France and invest in a winery in this area in 1997. It's a high altitude area with the estate itself sitting at 3,700 feet and the vineyards are still higher. It is very dry, so Jean drilled a well nearly 500 feet deep to access water to irrigate the vineyards. This is important since the valley as a whole only gets about 18 inches of rain per year, slightly less than the typical minimum needed for viticulture, which is 20 inches per year. I got two sparklers from these guys. I'm going with the rosé for this episode because I just love rosé sparkling wine, especially during my first course of a meal. I'll drink white sparkling too in this situation, but I do love rosé sparkling. It tends to have more flavor and nice light red fruit. While most of us think about going with champagne, I'm going with Argentine bubbly. A bit off the beaten path, but I'm always excited to do what's different and mix traditional with new things. One thing to note is that this wine uses what is known as the Charmat method. That means the second fermentation that produces the bubbles occurs in a tank rather than a bottle, like the champagne method. It has the advantage of being able to naturally produce a sparkling wine in a faster, less expensive way. Now, here are the stats for the wine. The non-vintage Domaine Bousquet Charmat Brut Rosé. Suggested retail price is $13. It's from the Guatiari Valley, Tupangato, Uco Valley, Mendoza, Argentina. 75% Pinot Noir, 25% Chardonnay, certified organic vineyard. It's made with organic grapes. This is different than 100% organic, but it does require 100% organic grapes. Make sure you watch my Freestyle Friday episodes on organic uh, farming practices and wine. It's hand harvested. Elevation is 1,200 meters or 3,900 feet. The soil is a mixture of gravel and sand. The ABV is 12%. The total acidity is 5.5 grams per liter. And the RS is 8.2 grams per liter. The back label has this listed as AZ, which stands for azucar, Spanish for sugar. That was a new one on me. I didn't know exactly what to make of it. I actually had to email my friends, uh, Jane and Kate, to be like, what's the AZ? I figured it was the residual sugar, but had to make sure. And then a buddy of mine was like, I think uh, azucar is sugar in Spanish. And sure enough, it is. All right, so next is the one I bought in clearance locally. I was doing some shopping and hit the clearance area. Sometimes they have some cool wines there, but most of the time it's not something I'm interested in or, or is a great deal. This is pretty much both. I picked up a traditional wine, but not from a traditional place. Oregon Riesling. I haven't had a lot of them, but the ones I've had have been excellent. This comes from the Union Wine Company. I'm more familiar with their line of canned wines rather than bottles, but obviously they do both. I had their Underwood line of canned wines a couple years ago as part of a 
Pool Essentials episode with my friends Christian and Laurelyn. It appears they were founded in 2005 by Ryan Harms. His bio says that he moved to Oregon in 2001 and worked for some Oregon wineries for a while before founding Union. They are located in Tualatin, Oregon. I think I got that right. A suburb in the far southwest part of Portland. They don't have any kind of hours listed on the site, so I imagine they don't really have a tasting room or even a by appointment only thing to visit. They have three brands, Underwood, Alchemist, and this one, Kings Ridge. From what I can tell, they source out their they source out grapes for their wines. Just to be clear, this is perfectly fine. Some of the best wines in the world do this, Burgundy and Champagne being a couple of the most famous. The Underwood brand focuses on cans and they source from all over Oregon. The other two are more traditional with bottles and Willamette Valley as the source of their grapes. The Riesling isn't specifically on their site. However, they do have the text sheets for it under the trade section. I'm not really sure why. Riesling is a great food wine, especially for the holidays. It pairs well with a lot of traditional dishes from turkey to ham, sweet potatoes, salads, etc. Here, so now here are the stats for this wine. The 2020 Union Wine Company Kings Ridge Riesling. Normal price was $14.98. The clearance price was $7.49. It's from Willamette Valley. It's 100% Riesling, 100% stainless steel. The ABV is 12.9%. The RS or residual sugar is 1.56 grams per liter. The pH is 3.11 and the total acidity is 8 grams per liter. This is going to be a high acid but very dry, almost bone dry Riesling. I'm super excited to try it. The last wine, going a bit off the truly traditional here. Uh, I mean, not traditional for most people, but if you're in an Italian family, then Italian fare is what's on the menu. I'll be honest here. Uh, okay, I'm always honest, but for real. I'm recording this the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Now, friends of ours are coming over to the house and we'll be picking up food from our favorite Italian restaurant in San Antonio called Paisano's. So I need an Italian wine and I happen to have this one. Sadly, it's the only Italian wine I have. But yes, we'll actually be having this with our Thanksgiving dinner. Or maybe not. Considering uh, seafood's on the menu and I'm having veal, probably going to use the actual Chardonnay from the Thanksgiving episode. So uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that was the plan was to use this with Thanksgiving dinner. But anyway, if I was going to pull something for Christmas, it would be this too, since we'd also have Italian. Now, that's assuming we don't go out to a restaurant. We might. We may stay at home. Anyway, I got this wine as part of a thank you for volunteering at the Texom International Wine Awards. So it's a freebie. I really wasn't familiar with the winery. I just grabbed it because it's Italian and I don't have a lot of, it, a lot of those wines. And the label's pretty killer, especially since I'm a former astronomy major. The estate has been around for a very long time. It's on the boundary between the provinces of Siena and Florence. It was originally a defensive tower with references to it as early as 1183 under the name Nectar Dei, the Nectar of God. Then Michelangelo Buonarroti comes into the picture. Yes, the Michelangelo. You know, the one who painted the Sistine Chapel in 1549, not the turtle. It was during this time that he would send the first bottles of Natardi wine to the popes at the time. Over the centuries, the property changed hands many times. I'm not certain if wine was made during all that time, but in 1982, a publisher from Frankfurt named Peter Femfert and his Venetian wife, Stefania Canali, bought the place. The vineyards were replanted, and in 1992, the vat room was modernized. They also hired some talented staff to handle winemaking and other positions. In 1999, they purchased land in the Marema part of southern Toscana. They have planted 20 hectares of vineyards with a variety of local and international varieties. These vineyards are where the wine comes from. This wine <laughs> comes from. They also created a line of wines to honor Michelangelo where a well-known artist paints the label and wrapping paper for their Casanova di Natari wine from the Vigna Doguesa vineyard. The website says that this was started in 1981. I think they meant it started with the 1981 vintage since they bought the property in 82. This is their second wine from the Morema region with their first wine being Nectar Dei. The Nectar Dei wine has resumed the tradition of giving the Pope the first bottles of wine each year. Arastra refers to the Latin phrase per aspera arastra, or through hardships to the stars, or our aspirations take us to the stars, or 
a rough road leads to the stars. It kind of depends on who's translating it. The website says this is true with great wines, as greatness requires a great deal of loving work and care in the vineyards. The grapes for this wine come from their southern Marema estate called Mongibello della Mondolaia, located south of Scanzano and close to Montiano. It's planted to seven different varieties, the five main border varieties, along with Sangiovese and Alicante Boucher. It is also, it is also a certified organic vineyard. Now, according to the website, all of their vineyards are certified organic as of 2017. I couldn't find an indication of that on the label of this wine, however. There's also a discrepancy of grape varieties on the label versus the website. The back label has the 2018 blend, so I'll use the website's text sheet for 2017 for our purposes. It's very likely an oversight by the winery when preparing the shipment for the importer. Many of the wines for this importer have their sticker added to the back label, whereas this appears to have been printed at the winery with the importer's name already on it. Basically, you know, this, this discrepancy may also explain why there is no indication of being organic. Maybe it was a rush job and a lot of copy and paste happened. Maybe they used the 2016 as a template, which wasn't organic, and copied the 2018 info while keeping the vintage correct. Who knows? Maybe what the back label says is correct. I'll tell you what the back label says here in a second. Well, actually, I'll tell you what it says right now. It says 50% Sangiovese, 25% Cabernet Sauvignon, and 25% Cabernet Franc. With that said, here are the stats for the wine according to the text sheet. The 2017 Natari Arastra, around $30 retail. Marema Toscana DOC, it's 50% Sangiovese, 25% Cabernet Sauvignon, so that matched up. Then 15% Cabernet Franc and 10% Merlot. 14 months in 10% new and 90% used Barrique and Tonneau. A barrique typically means a Bordeaux barrel of about 200, of, of, not about, of 225 liters. And a tonneau is a larger barrel. In Italy, that can be anything from 300 to 750 liters, sometimes larger in other countries. I usually envision around 500 liters when I think about these barrels. There really isn't a specific amount for these as they can go as high as 900 or 1,000 liters. Um, so it spends a few months in concrete for blending, four months in bottle before release. Bottled August 2019. So this has been in bottle for just over two years after being released in December of 2019. The ABV is 14%, the pH is 3.3, and the total acidity is 5.45 grams per liter. Now that I've given you some background on these wines, let's taste. I gotta do some water first. All right, I'm super excited. So these wines have been sitting out for 30-ish minutes as I was setting up. Uh, the sparkling wine is a little warm uh, as far as serving temperature. But, you know, I think I just ripped that off. Yeah, it wasn't the proper way to do it. But with it being a little bit warmer, um, that means it'll have better taste going on here. All right. Now let's see if I can open it up without making too much noise. It's coming out, and here we go. Just that soft kiss. Ooh, it's gonna pop. There we go. Ta-da. Yeah, it's a little bit warmer than I would normally have it when I'm opening. All right, give myself a nice little pour here. As you see, I do not have the spit bucket. I'm only recording two episodes today, and these are celebratory wines, so I am going to celebrate a little bit. Now, just so I, since I know I'm not going to pour anymore, just gonna put that little thing on there. Yes, I'm going to have a, 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 yes, eventually, sometime next year, an episode about champagne stoppers. All right. Uh, let's also get this wine going. We're going to taste all three right in a row. Get my Corvin capsule thing there. Get the Riesling going. I'm super excited to try all these wines. Alrighty. Like I said, I've only had a few Oregon Rieslings the past couple years. So I'm excited to try this one, especially the one that's so affordable. Put that there. And then this wine I'm super excited to try. 
I am super excited to try this one. I've had this wine for a few months now and I've been wanting to open it for a while and haven't been able to. So, well, I mean, I have, I could have opened it, but I really been waiting for a review. And I was like, as we're getting closer to the holidays, I'm like, you know what? I'll do it for a holiday review wine. Alrighty. I don't need that the rest of the show. Okay. So, um, Hi, Corbin. I will keep you on display because you know what? You guys took care of me. At least you gave me a new one. All right. Um, and give me some capsules and all that cool stuff. So let's get right into this wine. So, I mean, color-wise, well, first there's a ton of bubbles, but color-wise, it's really like, it's not quite salmon. It's almost like a watermelon pink. Uh, yeah, it's like a, a good, actually, it really just looks like a like a kind of a, well, rose, it's actually a little bit lighter than a rose uh, in like the actual flower, but it's kind of like this pink watermelon candy look to it. You know, like those hard candies, like the, like the stick candies, it's kind of got that to it. So maybe it'll have some watermelon flavor to it. It's weird because power suggestion happens and you know, you look into the wine like, well, and then it doesn't really happen, but let's check it out. And yes, regular glasses. So um, really I'm getting, just getting a lot of like the, 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 the carbonation right now coming out. I get kind of light red fruit, not a ton, but let's see if we swirl a little bit, maybe, you know, strawberry. I, I really do think I get a little bit of watermelon on this. A little peach, some raspberry. These are all super, super faint. Like it's like, hints like it just kind of like whatever first comes to mind is what I'm going with so let's just taste it so it's dry it had uh, 8.2 I believe on the uh I might just look at the back of the label because it tells me exactly what it is I think it's 8.2 on this 8.2 grams per uh residual sugar or the dosage so um that's really good man it's not that you can taste the sugar, but you can tell there's a balancing act between the sugar and the acid. Lots of acid. It's That's what sparkling wine should be, really high in acid. And then your dosage, your RS, helps balance things out. But yeah, I got that raspberry, that strawberry, a um, little bit of red apple, a touch of the watermelon. And these, these fruits are, they're not super tart, but they're not like super ripe. They're kind of in that in-between there's a, it's not really a sweetness of the fruit. It's just like a, a flavor of the fruit. So yeah, I mean, this is something where your first course, or maybe like you're having some appetizers, maybe having a little bit of cheese, a little bit of charcuterie type of thing going on, a crudite, this would be great with that. But I can really envision this with something like, um, like a salad with some leafy greens, um, spring mix, even though it's not spring, but you know, like a spring mix. You could even do like arugula, you could do kale. There's the bitterness of that. I think the fruit will help with it, especially if you throw some cranberries in there. Uh, you throw maybe some strawberries in there, some red fruit of some sort in with the salad. You could throw some nuts. I don't get a ton of like nuttiness or, or um, uh, brioche. Now, one thing, I did say that it was disgorged it says on here. I know it does. I can't find a label, but the text sheet had, had the disgorgement date. Uh, so it was disgorged a while ago. Not, not too far. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's not on the label. I guess I don't have the disgorgement date. Well, there was no disgorgement because it's Charmant. That's why. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's, it's still pretty fresh. And yeah, you don't really, that's one of the things like a lot with, with like Charmat, you're not doing Asia on the leaves. So you're probably not going to get the nuttiness and you're not probably not going to get that brioche. And that's one of the things that separates it from champagne method, but it's still light, refresh, refreshing, crisp, perfect for like a salad or a first course. I wouldn't say maybe soup, maybe like a French onion soup, which isn't exactly a traditional Christmas thing, unless you're French, I guess, or a French American. Um, but well, I guess it's, they do, they serve that in France. I, I had some there, 
But I can see a French onion soup being really good with this. Um, you can even do it like with ham, with your turkey, things like that. If you're having some type of chicken, this would be excellent with that. I'm gonna leave a little bit left in there. Let's move on to the Riesling. So the Riesling, you know, has a, a pretty good color. Like sometimes Rieslings might look a little bit, um, not watery, but washed out. But this has got, this has got some color to it. And it's, it's not old. This is what, a 20? 19? Yeah, 20. So it's not, it's not old. But um, yeah, it's kind of got this yellow gold look to it, which makes me kind of think there, there either there was some type of oxidation, oxidation going on, but it's, it's, but it's got a green gold to it. So it doesn't, I don't know, it does not gold, brown, reddish gold, which is oxidation, oxidation. This is more of a green gold. So indicating young and probably pretty fresh. Let's just smell it. Unmistakably the reason, like you've got that petrol. It's more of like that, it's more of that, um, that rubber, that tire, rubber tire thing going plastic shower curtain. It's for you, Craig, if you're watching it, that's my mentor. Yeah, I mean, it really is kind of that plasticky thing, almost like the, also kind of like the wax animal that you that you used to get at the zoo, which I have no idea if they make those machines anymore. Oh God, they were so, I just caught a whiff of something. It's all it's all that petrol type of stuff. It was like a, it, it took me back to like going to my grandmother's house in in Florida, like my mother's mother, like, and it was like a a a, a whiff of like a pool toy, or like or like the uh. Not the pool toy, but like the um, the 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 float that you blow up and take to the take to the take to the beach. That that's what it smelled like. Memories are so powerful; they they bring back things you never you haven't thought about in decades. It, it really is mostly that, but I get some green apple on this, a little bit of lemon, lime, peach. That's about it. Give it a good swirl. Maybe I'll get some out of it. Yeah, it's like all those. It's like all those fruits are like on like a plastic tray, like an inflatable tray, like you're at the pool type of thing. Let's taste it. This is delicious. I might have this tomorrow. I don't know. I got all kinds of wines to pull for tomorrow. But anyway, so you've got all that again. You've got that pool toy type of thing, that little bit of plastic, a little bit of rubber, a little bit of tire, a little bit of inflatable raft, and then You've got like serving this, this smorgasbord of fruit. You've got like, you got a little bit of red cherry, got a little bit of that grape that, you know, this is like a fruit cup, like the old school fruit cup with the juice in it, with the syrup. So you got the, you got the grape, you got white grape, you got red cherry, you got peach, you got a uh, pear, apple, green apple. Um, yeah, the pear especially. And it's bone dry. Like, I want to say bone dry, but it's dry. The acidity's there. Like, there's no, there's no way anyone would call this a sweet Riesling. This is dry. This is very food friendly, too. You could also kind of sit back and enjoy it, but it really is better with food. You could have it with your turkey. You could have it totally with your turkey, especially if you've got, like, the stuffing. The, the richness of that stuffing will balance with the acidity of the, of the, um, at, of the wine. You've got the sweet potatoes. It'll be a balancing act there. You'll have the sugar from the sweet potatoes. I'm doing Thanksgiving, I guess, but Christmas, you can have Thanksgiving ham. You can have, you know, ham, the ham. Oh yeah, you know, the ham with the pineapples and the cloves. Dude, this would be killer with Christmas ham. Cause you get that, you get that honey glaze, you get the pineapple, get the clove, throw some Riesling in there, bam. Done, son. Yeah, that's it. That's the that's the pairing right there. All right, so the red wine, the Italian wine, super excited to do this one. So we've got, you know, a pretty deep color of red. It's pretty much red all the way throughout. Got a little bit of rim variation at the edge, but for the most part, it's red throughout. There's a touch of browning, which is weird. Not weird. I mean, it's four years old. San Giovese can age pretty quickly or can brown faster than others as 50% Sangiovese and then 50% is whatever else, depending on whose information you're looking at. But there's definitely Cab and Cap Franc in there. 
possibly Merlot. But yeah. So yeah, I mean, this... Oh, God, it smells good. It smells like I just walked into the barrel room of a winery. So yes, it means I smell oak. But it's not it's not a ton of oak on it. I mean, they... I mean, they, they put it in a variation of, of stuff and most of it was uh, used barrique. So it's there, but it's not, it's not like, you know, screaming like new oak, but you get this black and red fruit. You get blackberry and raspberry. You also get a bit of strawberry. You get vanilla, clove, but you also get this earthiness. You get this, you get this little bit of tobacco on it and you get fresh turned earth. And the vanilla and clove is, is like kind of just like a touch. It's like just a little like seasoning. It's not, it's not a ton. It's more about smelling wood, honestly. It's all about like walking into a room that has this great old wood that, that has this aroma to it. There is a touch of tar going on there. I don't, I'm looking for it. I don't really get the volatile acidity that's typical Italian wines. In, in this case, a super Tuscan it probably won't be very present because they're trying not to have it in a wine. So I don't really get it. They're trying to make a wine in a more international style, but using Sangiovese a lot of times as the base, not all Super Tuscans have Sangiovese. Some are completely devoid of Sangiovese. It's all international varieties, but that's the reason they use, that's the reason they use these international varieties. Or in this case, the Marema uh, Toscana DOC exists and they're allowed to use international varieties, whereas Chianti, they're really not. And the just IGT Toscana, they can do whatever they want, pretty much. So, a little licorice. Let's just taste it. It's juicy. You've got, that fruit is really fresh. It's, it's ripe, it's not overly ripe. It's ripe, but it finishes drier. So it starts with a little bit of a sweet attack or ripe attack, and then finishes really dry. You got the, got red apple skin. You've got strawberry. You got raspberry. A little bit of cranberry in there. It's on the drier side, kind of on the back of the palate. Um, you've got blackberry. I thought I say that black raspberry. You've got that fresh earth. You've got a little bit of um, oregano to it, or dried herbs. Um, not the herb, but dried herbs. So I mean, Cap Franc's in it. I mean, there's an herbaceousness to it and a little bit of fern. I, I kind of think that's where the cab and cab are coming into play. Give you a little bit of green. Yeah. A matter of fact, I do, I mean, because I'm looking for it and I'm convincing myself it's in there. But I do get a little bit of herbaceousness that's more, more associated with the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Cabernet Franc uh, uh, grapes. Merlot can have it too, but the two cabs are usually more likely to have it. Earthy, a little bit of tobacco, green tobacco on that. A little bit of red uh, flower, like rose, kind of dry, a little potpourri. Those oak characteristics, so like the vanilla, not really vanilla, but that, that vanilla and clove are really muted on the palate. It's, it's like, like a, a sprinkle of it, it's like a dash. It's really not that much at all. It's really hard. It's more on the nose than anything else. This is juicy. The tannin is, it's not ripping high. We're not talking Barolo, but man, it's medium plus. It's building. So this is something where, yes, you could have it with a turkey if you're doing that for Christmas, but I would say more like a roast beef. If you're having, say, a roast beef for Christmas or it's Italian wine, you're having something like lasagna. You're having something like a... a a bolognese sauce, you know, some of rich and meaty and big and bold. You're doing something like that. You could even have it with a steak, maybe a steak pizzaiola. All right. So you have like a really like a, like a red sauce on top of, on top of the pizza. It would be fantastic with that. Yeah. Stew, all kinds of stuff like that, but just like rich pastas and, and meat sauce or just red sauce, but meat sauce really give you that extra bit of of uh, marbling, like a bit of fat to go along with it. It'd be great. Chicken parm, maybe veal parm, mar probably more veal parm than chicken parm. I think I think they would overpower the chicken, even though you got red sauce usually on it. 
You get like a, a rosé sauce. You get some Alfredo and, and marinara mixed together. Now you're talking, dude. Throw a little pesto in there. Like the, combine all three. A little gnocchi. All kinds of good stuff with that, with the Italian side. But on the more traditional Christmas side, I would say richer proteins like roasts, uh, roast beef, London broil, something like that. Rack of lamb may be a little, may not be enough, but it might be. Chicken, no. Like a regular like grilled chicken, no, no one really makes chicken for, for, uh, for Christmas. Maybe somebody does, I don't know. Um, ham, maybe, but I think, I think the ham is better with these two wines. So yeah, I, if you're having Italian food, this is absolutely perfect with it. All right. Well, you know, that's going to do it for the wine. I hope you have a Merry Christmas this year. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe and then tell all your friends about it until next time. Drink some cool Italian wine or the others. Salute.